good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've had enough of these corner shop uh, pan houses. I'm, I'm going to go for the Amazon version this time. <laughs> and you'll obviously notice another thing, that my name is not on the title page. That's deliberate, because if you don't like it, then you don't know who I am. <laughs> the St. Philip's Salt Works is the last of a number of salt works that were built in the St. Monan's area, some towards the village and some beyond the village towards Pitnwyn. But there was a shortage of salt in 1770, and they decided to set up a company, the New York Coal and Salt Company, to build the salt works. And by, by 1874, by the time the works was built, the actual shortage had disappeared, and they ended up having to form an association to share the work between all the various salt pans on the, on the fourth. This is a very much reduced uh, location map, uh, but it's basically to show you where St. Monans is. St. Monans, on the outer part of the fourth estuary, um, quite good because uh, the salt, the saline condition would be slightly more intense out there than it, fit, than it is further up the fourth. Now this photograph I think was taken by Colin during his expeditions of the 1980s in the air and it shows the, uh, the remains of the salt works that were actually visible at the time. The, uh, roofless wind engine, an outer reservoir, a very faint inner reservoir, a rock cut channel, and that stretch is where the salt pans were or are. Now three or four weeks into the dig, that was the end product of what you saw in the previous photograph if you can remember that far back. <laughs> anyway, nine pan houses cleared. The expression excavation is really an exaggeration here because the brief was to actually uncover all nine pan houses with a view to landscaping them as a visitor attraction. And that took quite a lot of work by hand, I'll, I'll have you know. Well, that's not strictly true. For three weeks, I had two 18-ton diggers, and we excavated an area of approximately 2,700 square metres to a maximum depth of three metres. And my calculations told us that we'd excavated 10,000 tons. We lost 7,000, that wasn't easy, and kept 3,000 for the landscaping later on. Now this is a, a schematic of the actual site itself, and you have the nine pan houses, basically similar in format, but some slight differences. For instance, Reading from left to right, houses one and two and three and four are mirror images of each other. Now, this may mean that the same the pair of houses was being operated by one team, or it may have been an adjustment of the layout to facilitate water delivery to the pan houses without having extra pipes and plumes to fall over. Pan houses five to eight varied in the, the central access between the four house at the top of the, the building and the pan house at the bottom. 
was curved. And so I'm not quite, not quite sure why they did that. The first four were tapered. And the effect that that has is as the air passes through into the fire, where the passage narrows, the velocity increases and you obviously get a better burn on the fire. Further down you'll see the outer reservoir, the inner pond, wooden pipes, I'll come to them shortly. Then you have a, a pipe trench running up towards the wind engine. Just to the left of that was part of an enclosure, the internal wall of which had been puddled. And I think that may have been a header tank for storage, for disposal of brine to the rest of the pan houses. <coughs> Top right, you see a little section of the wagon way, which Colin will cover. Below that, we believe was part of a girnel. Now, we only found the one, but because of the limitation of time, we couldn't go any further east. I think there had to be more than one girnel for nine pan houses, especially at maximum, maximum production. And the next trench down, trench number nine, was possibly a coal store or maybe the fire end of another kernel. This shows a little section of the ballast base for the wagon way, which took the, brought the coal down to the rear of the pan houses and also would have taken salt back up heading towards Pintmuir. Now, we come to the pan houses themselves. Anybody who's ever been to St. Monan's would see one of the pan houses has been left exposed. The condition of them was all very poor, to be quite honest with you. And I don't know what state that one is in now, but it was the one that clearly demonstrated the layout. You have the Ford house at the top with the little enclosure for the coal chute which backed onto the wagon way so as the coal could be tipped in directly. You've then got a flagged floor leading to an offset, I call it a central passage, it isn't in fact central, it's slightly offset because I think what, what they did was they only operated the pan from one side and therefore had a wider platform on the operating side than they did on the other side. You've then got two internal walls which were part of the support arrangement for the pan itself. These pans are almost certainly brander type as opposed to sole pans. In other words, the pans were supported clear of a great system. And I also think in this case that there may have been an ash pan below that as well, because you can you see at the two side doors and the end door, there were deposits of ash, but nothing in the middle. Now, how did the ash not get into the middle if it was just simply a brander arrangement without a cover? And that would have made it much easier to clear out the debris once you had finished. This is the south end of pan house number seven. And you can see in the corners there, the ash in position and nothing in the middle. The little trench there is the only part of the site that we actually got down to floor level and it turned out to be flagstones. And I think had it been sole pans, it would have, been, would have been brick. I think you might have seen this image before. <laughs> um, this was actually poached by Brownrigg or the, at least the stylistically poached from 
Agricola in 1556. In fact, Agricola was called George Bauer. He was a German, but whether he was pre predisposed to invade Scotland again, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> anyway, looking at it, it's almost certain that the support structure that you see on the lower left existed at St. Monan's Pans as well. Because looking at the pan, I've done my sums on this. The standard pan for that period was 18 feet by nine in old money, or five and a half meters by two and three quarters. Made out of six millimeter plate, a basic pan would weigh a ton. Put a foot of water or 30 millimeters of water in it, that's another four and a half tons. So you have to have a support structure because once it's, it's wrought iron, which is fairly malle malleable. Anyway, they tried cast iron, but it was too brittle. It was fairly malleable. Not only that, is once it heats up, the plates will attempt to expand and distort the whole structure. So hence the reason for needing to support the structure to stop the, the pan base collapsing. I'm not quite sure how the pans were constructed. I would have a preferred a butt-to-butt -butt join rather than an overlap because it would have been difficult enough to rake the salt out with these hanging supports without having to get over the edge of plates as well. So I suspect that they were riveted to support struts underneath. But that's only a, an educated case, well, or an uneducated case. This was my original idea of a reconstruction of I didn't have all this fancy graphics. I think, I think my report was allegedly written on a Sinclair ZX something or other. <laughs> so I didn't have the uh, Garris uh, availability of uh, fancy graphics. But what I'm pretty certain of is you see the hooks hanging there. In order to be able to maintain the pan, they had to have lifting apparatus. And there are references to a turning tree, 23 feet long. Now that wasn't for stirring the salt. So I think, um, or the other expression used is a cope, which it's not, this is not an African change of government. This is an old Scots expression for turning over. Um, I haven't put in the infrastructure and I have the chimney at the far end for the obvious reason that if you're putting coal in at one end, the only way you're going to get a decent disposition of the heat under the pan is by having the flow of air through to the far end. The one that Gareth showed um, with the chimney in the middle would have had a limited efficiency, but I think it was, it had to go there because there nowhere, they had nowhere else to put it. So it wasn't a, 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 de, a deliberate act. Now, one of the interesting things, the other interesting technical point about this site was how the water actually got there, got up to the pans themselves. We've got it coming in the rock channel. That's fine, that's not a problem. But part of the way from the shore, which has eroded by quite a bit since the pans were abandoned, there were these two lovely, perfectly preserved wooden pipes through a bulkhead. And I think the bulkhead is the only remains of a water house which was part of a filtration system. The pipes themselves are actually suspended above the, the base of the trench. So 
I got a, t a couple of the team to go down. I says, I'm looking for a tunnel. And they looked at me as if I was mad. So that just shows you the very fine taper fit of the pipe. That's the, that's the very north end of the rock cut channel. And you can see there's a slight undercut there, a tunnel. Now my thought was, there was looking at the topography of the site, the heights, the horizontal distance travelled, etc. To me, there appeared to be only two options. One was either a lift pump or a suction pump, although it doesn't work with some suction. The piston creates a vacuum and air pressure pushes the liquid in. But it sounds like suction. Anyway, with the heights that it was going to have to pump it by that method, I didn't think it would have enough power or enough efficiency to do it. So I was looking for a lift pump. And the only restriction in a lift pump is the amount of power that you can actually put into the piston. There's a, there are several varieties depending on the valve arrangement, but that would have that would have done the job, but I needed input because that would only really work vertically. So I was looking for something next to the wind engine. We couldn't unfortunately get any more than about three metres into the tunnel because there wasn't enough room. No, there wasn't enough time either. However, in the wind engine itself, the main be beam slot that you see there is pointing towards the salt pans. What's this other channel going out the east door? The excavation of the windmill stopped at the east door. They never investigated. I didn't do that particular part. They never investigated beyond that. I think there may be a vertical shaft there because the brine tunnel, as I call it now, points to the east of the wind engine. There was a curious feature as well, that there was a pipe trench which exited in the face of the, um, in the face of the, the cliff um, at the, the seashore. But the actual transfer of power, whatever it was, from the wind engine to the rock cut channel which was absolutely solid at the bottom. I thought it was going to be a hole there, though. No. was done in two stages. But that might have been to improve the mechanical efficiency of the actual equipment, rather than one long beam trying to do the work. In the shore, you can see the, a pipe inlet or outlet of some description. I think this was a later way of getting water to a limited number of pan houses because the history of the site was such that it, it was in its peak till about 1798 then there was a, a hiatus until 1807 and then it worked again for another six years but I'm, I'm fairly sure they weren't using all nine pan houses so a force pump may have worked then. And you can see all the debris has been dug out to insert the pipe and the pipe has been packed using debris. So it's obviously a later insertion. A view again from above, the far end at the top of the picture there, there may be more infrastructure there. And one of the periods that were there, just at the bottom of the picture, there was parching of the grass, suggesting there may be buildings there, possibly occupation for the workers. And after we were finished, we landscaped everything apart from pan house number seven. Now, I'm very hard of hearing, so if there are any questions, if you would care to write them on the back of a, 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 a banknote of any 
legal denomination, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you.